And away we go. Uh, hello, my name is Justin Sherrill. I work on uh, Foreman and Catello. And I've worked in Ruby for many years now um, and have debugged a lot of code. And I just wanted to share some of the tips and tricks um, that I use on a daily basis for the most part for various things um, when trying to figure out an issue here or there. I will say that I, I prefer the bug debugger, so that's what I'm going to show here. It is not in, um, it is not, you do not get it in a form of checkout by default, but I added in just adding bug to my gem file or my bundler.d um, local.rb file. And it's, I like it because it's simple. I don't know, it works the way my brain works. Um, binding dot, binding dot pry, pry is the one that is there by default. And a lot of these debugging tips will work with that, but you'll generally see um, my, uh, my usage of by bug here. Um, all right, so I've got a few, few scenarios here. Um, we see we have a, a car class who, that has one method drive. And we have an entry script, which just calls um, mycar.drive. And so if I run this entry script, you would expect it to print out driving, but uh, the transmission is broken. So we, what's going on here? You know, it's this method is clearly printing drive or printing uh, driving. So where is that even coming from? So let's figure that out. Um, I'm going to put a debugger in. Oh, sorry. After the, the drive gets called, and if I run it again. So we're here. So I can run manually my car drive, and I see it's still printing the wrong thing. So what is it? What you know? What is it doing? Well, this is Ruby, and we hit all, all the time in Rails, or even in in Foreman with lots of plugins. Uh, plugins can modify functionality. They can modify behavior. So let's see if we can figure out where that method is coming from. You can use the methods method uh, on any sort of object to see all the methods that are in a on an object or a class. And so if we look up the method uh, drive, you can see it's found it. And what is this? Well, that's the source location. And for some reason, I actually don't see that when I run in Rails, um, but you can use the source location method to actually see that some other file has been, has defined this. So it's overridden the car class to define it. So this is unexpected behavior that I can use Ruby to help me narrow down where it's coming from. And this is super useful if you're not sure where maybe some method is defined within a plugin or some base uh, Rails module you can find it to uh, investigate it further. The other thing we can do is, all right, so there's something about the transmission. Maybe, you know, I, I remember somebody telling me about um, a, a method to fix the transmission, but I don't remember exactly what it is. You can actually just grep for methods. So, oh, there's a fixed transmission uh, method. So we can call my car .fixed transmission. And then my car dot drive. And uh, well, I was supposed to print something out, but you can see we didn't get the error now. So that's good. Um, so you can use these helper helper functions that Ruby provides or helper methods to find new methods that maybe you remember part of the name of, but also find where the location is. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was something that combines sort of two things in a way that you may not think about. I use this a lot for controller tests, but there are many other uses for it. If we, I've got a simulated Rails controller here. And you can see there's a before action defined and then a an index method or an index action. And if we look in our controller test, we've got a bunch of tests here. Uh, that are all testing the index method. So if we run the controller tests, we see that there was a failure. 
on line 26. So let's open it up. And on line 26, or the, the actual request, it's passing an organization ID. So maybe, maybe it's a problem with the finder. So if we open up the controller, let me put a, a buy bug here to help debug, right? But it's, it's hitting it for every single test, right? And for tests, you can run a single test uh, on the, from the command line. Sometimes you don't want to do that. Sometimes you want to make sure your changes aren't breaking other things, or sometimes um, maybe there's a, an issue that, that requires other tests to be run to hit, which is hopefully not the case, but sometimes is the case. Or if you're not in a, in tests, in a test um, scenario, maybe you've got something running from outside of Rails, you know, hitting the Rails server that's triggering a bunch of stuff, and you don't necessarily want it to, you don't want the buy bug to be hit for every single request, or if it's part of a batch to be hit for every single item. So sort of a trick to keep in the back of your mind is using uh, environment variables. So here I know that the issue is only during this test. So I can just define environment variable here, and then afterwards, set it back to nil. And the important thing to note here is it has to be a string. So if we go back into the controller where our buy bug is, I can then add a uh, an if statement to just check if that debug environment variable is set. So now if I run the controller test, you can see it was the two tests already ran, and so it just hit it on this one particular test. Um, oh. Why did it not reset it? Well, let me check that. Oh, wait. Okay. Try that again. That's strange. That's interesting. Anyways, but uh, what you should, I'm sure there's a typo somewhere, but you should be seeing is it, uh, oh, I actually, I know what the problem is because the test failed, sorry. So you, we need to put that in ensure block because the, um, an exception was being thrown, so that wasn't being hit. But now if we run it, you see it's only hit that one time. So this helps narrow down if you're if you're finding you put a, a debugger statement in somewhere and it's being hit, you know, tens or hundreds of times. Using an environment variable to help narrow down when it gets hit is is super helpful. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is Timing. So if you're, you're having a performance issue, so let's say, let's just cat this real quick. Um, all right. So if we run this Ruby file, we can see it's taking maybe a lot longer than we would expect. Um, if we time it, I think it took like, let's say, it was like 10 seconds. Yeah, there's six seconds. So if we if we look at this, which of these is taking a long time? And a common thing that I've done is you can use blocks to create a simple time method. Uh, so you, a simple three line method, and you can make it a little bit nicer. You can add a message here. And then all you have to do is um, call each of these with that, with that block. And real quick. Uh, 
and I'll make these unique. And if we rerun it, oh, where's my mistake? You forgot to print. Oh, I'll print. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, Sorry, I, yeah. I forgot a, uh, oh, wait, no, no. Well, let's see. Maybe. There we go. Sorry. You need a space after a minus. Um, and so we can see here clearly uh, the biggest performance problem is at uh, five or at B or D. That should be a D. I must like that. Um, and so you can, if you're unsure of where a performance problem is, the great thing is you can sprinkle these throughout your code. Right, so you can just uh, load them up with these time statements, execute the reproducer if you have a, the performance reproducer, and then um, examine the results afterwards. In Catello, we've actually included this within our code base. So there's a helper function, Catello logging time, and you can pass in um, a message, and you can also pass in uh, attributes. As, a, as another parameter. So you can, you can pass in sort of like, you know, object equals repository ID equals five um, as a hash at the end, and I'll print out those two. So that's super useful. And we've used this in a couple of places so that, you know, a user potentially even could turn on debugging and gather this output themselves and give it to us. The next thing I want to talk about is a bit more Catello specific, but it's an issue we hit quite a bit, and that is the dreaded uh, VCR tests. And so I'm sure if you've worked on, or if you've looked at Catello failures, you've probably seen these before. And the biggest, uh, the most common use case is when it's not sort of a transient issue, which I'll talk about in a second, is uh, when you made a change and you hit these errors and you don't know why. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the process that I use to look into that. Um, so I've got a test file here that I ran. Sorry, my dog is barking in the background. Um, to get that error, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna record the concepts real quick, and this will take about um, 30 seconds, I think. And so just as a primer, what VCR is, is it allows us to record HTTP requests um, during test runs so that if, if there is a change that changes a request, we know about it and we can verify that it's intended. It also allows us to validate functionality when we upgrade to new versions of, say, Pulp or Candlepin within Catello because we can uh, run them with, in live mode where it's actually talking to the server. So the test run was failing. Um, while that's running, I can talk. Uh, the test run was failing because of this post request. And so that's, that's mainly where we're going to put our, our effort into looking into. Soon 
there we go. So, so it recorded successfully, which means that talking to a live server, it was fine. Um, so if we look at the, the diff, so here's the cassette file that was re-recorded. Let's find that post request. Uh, yeah, so here's the post request. Uh, let's see, is that it? Oh, sorry, here it is. So you see here there was a change in the body of the request. And that's what we need to investigate. Um, changes in URLs are not ignored. The, pa the path matters, but the actual uh, uh, host name does not. But here we see that the body itself has a change. So, so how can we investigate that? Well, this is just base64 encoded. So if we come over here, we can um, base64. Deco. All right. Let's see. Well, all right. What I actually typically do is I use a, um, a, a web site to do it. You can do it on the command line. And I need to reshare my screen. All right, so if we uh, go to the nice base 64 decode.org website, uh, we can paste here and we get the actual body of the request. So then if we go back and we copy the same diff, but instead of getting this line, we get the new recording. We can see here that uh, we've got, here, I'll paste it into the doc. So here is the, here's the new line. And here is the old line. So, uh, sorry, I think I copied and pasted. This thing. Oh, I forgot to delete this line. That was wrong. Um, yeah, I forgot to delete the, the line that was in the minus of the diff. Uh, so let me replace that. So here's the the new and the old. Uh, and if you if you notice, there's no policy line uh, on the second line. So we can see that the policy dropped. So that tells us what changed. And now as a, as a person who maybe opened a pull request, we know was that intentional or not? If it wasn't, that's a big red flag. If it was, then it makes perfect sense. And then the last thing I want to talk about is, hold on one second. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about are transient unit failures, which we hit a lot in Catello. And the first thing you can do when you have a transient unit failure is try running the single test file that failed with the same seed number from the test run. And if you look at the Jenkins output, you can get the seed number and provide it as an environment variable. Um, if that still fails, I've in the past used many tests bisect. And this basically runs your full test suite and then runs partial test suite or partial test groupings to identify the smallest set of um, tests required to get the failure. And this has found some really bizarre or really obscure test failures in the past. And I've got a Bitly link here I'll, I'll um, paste in. But it goes through the entire process. This is the gist I wrote up after going through that process. And it's sort of tailored towards running from Foreman. So if you're trying to solve a test failure that only happens once in a blue moon, this is super helpful. It takes a really long time to run, um, but it generally is, is successful in finding those things. And that's all I had. I hope some of this is useful. Um, hopefully I've added some new ideas to your uh, toolbox, but uh, let me know if there are any other 
interesting tips that you've got that maybe others don't know. Um, I'd be curious to hear. Very much, Justin. Has anyone any questions or comments? Interesting. Um, how far away is your dog from where you're working? Like you're on, are you muted? Yes, uh, my wife let him into my into the room halfway through the through the presentation, <laughs> so and then and then he immediately wanted back out, which is the problem. Was the problem? They really have a thing with doors. Don't they? Um, Jeremy is asking, how do I use Bybug with Foreman Gem? I think you can't, right? In with the, you mean on a production installation, Jeremy? On dev. Oh, just add it to your um, bundler.d. Um, you should have like a my.local.rb in there. Or you can create one if not, and just add Bybug to there and then bundle install. Just the same way you would add any other gym. Yeah, wonder if anyone has tips on like like the production <laughs> for this debugging. I don't know. I know we've been trying to look into that and that this, this might be a good form to ask that. Yeah, it might be worth building a debugger as an RPM so that we can do that. Um, like yeah. so that maybe adding prior remote to as an RPM wouldn't be a terrible idea. There, there are like remote debuggers in Python. I'm sure it's there in Ruby. We are just figure out the gym. Yeah, where... well, Pry and Bybug both provide remote um, debugging capabilities. The problem is that on a production, at least an RPM installation, I can't speak for Debian, but on an RPM installation, you have to have an RPM, if, if my memory serves me right, you have to have an RPM with that gem installed. So you can't just gem install by bug on a production install and have it work. Uh, so we would need an RPM build of those things to be able to use them. Okay. Which might, oh, yeah. for, for the amount of effort, it might be worth doing because I imagine it's a low amount of effort. Yeah, I think I think it's a good idea if we can include that because I find a lot of times <laughs> I'm in a production environment and I, I have to anyway restart the server. It's a demo environment, so I have some flexibility there. Debugging would be handy there instead of printing everything and looking at log messages. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, anything else for anyone? Okay, Doc. Well, again, if you're watching this back on YouTube, and if you have any questions or any ideas um, or any points that you'd like to discuss, Feel free to reach out to us on um, Discourse, open a thread, or respond to the event thread with your comments. Um, so thank you all for, thank you, Justin, for this, and thank you all for your participation.